Welcome to the Painting of the Week podcast, where we look at some of the most significant paintings throughout history. Introducing your hosts, Phil Grabsky and Laura Bentham. Saving the rhino single-handedly with how much work I've had to do on this. You're keeping it. You're keeping your notes. Every single one, and no, I might even do one files. of those school uh, flow charts and with coloured pens. Oh, so because how, I've, I've learned so much. How artists lead to other artists. Yeah. Because in a million years, I never thought in my whole entire life that I'd be sitting talking about this. So we go. What do you think? Giotto, twelve sixty-seven, thirteen thirty-seven. <laughs> And then uh, maybe Leonardo, 1452, 1519, Jura, 1471. Yeah, okay, I get, I get what you're doing. <laughs> well, it depends what you keep coming up with next. <laughs> well, today we have Rubens, 1577 to 1640. And I've only had three days. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> well, yeah, it does to take, get to grips. Some people take them three years. Well, <laughs> um, Rubens' descent from the cross. I'll tell you why I thought of this to talk about today. Mm. (laughs) Partly because, no, actually primarily because I'm currently working on a film about Caravaggio and Rubens comes up more than once um, because this artist, which I think many people might think of as being Dutch or Belgian, in fact, he was born in Germany, um, but he was in Rome and... um, he intertwines, is that the right word? Intertwines with Caravaggio's biography at certain points. Um, and uh, there's one or two artworks, unless I'm mistaken, of Caravaggio's that have disappeared that Rubens did a copy of. So it's, it's from the copy. Um, and I'm racking my brains. I'm sure in the Leonardo film uh, there is... Um, is it later in the Swan, where the original has gone, but we have Rubens' copy of it? Something like that. Well, that's anyway. handy. Then if you kept on copying. Yeah. Do you and think the, the Caravaggios will turn up? <laughs> It'd be amazing. Well, it's easy to say no, but, mm. um, I mean, right now there are at least two Caravaggios uh, that are relatively recent. Wow. That'd be and amazing. And then, of course, this, you know, it raises quite a lot of debate. Mm. One of them I've seen, and I'm not an expert, but I'm totally convinced by. And the other one I haven't seen, but anyway, it doesn't really matter what I think. But um, <laughs> so yeah. it doesn't matter what I think. Well, I would probably walk past it. <laughs> well, that's also part of the reason for looking at this painting. Okay, because <laughs> um, <laughs> couple of, I mean, it was supposed to have been released in... 2020 and then released in 2021 but because of covid both those releases cinema releases were postponed and now it's currently scheduled for next easter 2022 and that's our film called easter in art and easter in art was me trying to grapple with um something which is basically religious art, which, frankly, was not my favourite genre. Um, If I went to a gallery, I would probably be heading to, you know, Dutch art or 19th century French art or maybe even Russian 20th century, early 20th century. I mean... um, there were probably lots of the galleries that I would go to before heading to the Baroque, the you know the the the, the, the kind of galleries that contained images of Easter. But somebody said to me that the National Gallery in London, about one third of the paintings on display are covering religious topics. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's true; never checked it. Mm-hmm. But certainly, when you start becoming aware of religious art and start going looking for it, and in particular the Easter story, you realise how many paintings were done through history of this seven, eight-day period. Um, And the first thing that we did when we made the film actually was to... um, Oh, by the way, I didn't say, hello, I'm Phil. Oh, no. 
I didn't say hello, I'm Laura. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> anyway, there you go. Um, We're still back. We're still here. Still here. Um, I know I'm still here. <laughs> but the, um, the first thing that I did was I read the Gospels and... I don't think I don't think I've met a person that really knows the Easter story. Oh, I'm really pleased you said that because um, I'm I get nervous talking about things like this for fear of upsetting people with my lack of knowledge. Um, because if you say the wrong thing, the, well, there's a, di- yeah, there's a difference I, between I lack really, of knowledge and um, disrespect, isn't there? Yeah, true. Well, I would never want to upset upset anybody though. It was just because I was getting the people wrong and things like that when discussing. I mean, I've never discussed religious art ever. Well, here you go. This is the <laughs> first. <laughs> Mind you, yesterday I went to lunch with somebody who on their fridge had a, and I hope one day they get to hear this, they had a um, <laughs> uh, uh, um, fridge magnet. Yeah. Which was Jesus on the cross. Okay. And, um, yeah, anyway, <laughs> I'll move on. Okay. <laughs> but... but um, <laughs> Exactly. But, we don't want to upset anybody. No, we don't want to upset anybody. And no. I don't I don't think we should. No. I those don't. those but what I did learn, you talk about lack of knowledge or mm. is that I haven't yet met anybody that actually knows the story as it's told in the gospels in detail. I by reading those gospels carefully, and there's four main ones, and then you cross reference them a little bit, I got a much greater sense of of what is actually supposed to have happened. Now there comes a point when everything is dependent on faith and the faith Christianity in a broadly speaking is dependent. Your belief in Christianity is, is to a large degree dependent on whether you believe in the resurrection. I think it is widely, you know, I think we can safely say there was an individual Jesus and that he preached and that he was crucified. Mm -hmm. Um, let's take that as as read. Um, the question then was, did he, after three days, rise from the dead? Mm-hmm. Um, now, that's, we're not going to be able to prove that here. Um, so it's a question of faith. Now, in those in those Gospels, you just get the sense of Jesus coming to Jerusalem, um, riding into Jerusalem, and you've got the, the palms and the clearing of the temple and the betrayal, Last Supper, the whole events of the night between the betrayal and and the crucifixion, which happens very rapidly. Um, Pontius Pilate. Yeah, well, he's one of them, but yeah. there's, there's others too mm-hmm. that they keep getting him passed along. And and um, I remember that from school. You know, logistically, you could you could argue that it simply wasn't possible that you could see this amount of people overnight and in one day. Anyway, he's then crucified, and three days later, and they go to the tomb. The rock has been withdrawn from the entrance and the tomb itself is empty. And then you have Christ, for example, on the road to Emmaus. And then you have him having supper in Emmaus, which is a very, or, which is one of the famous Caravaggio paintings, is supper at Emmaus. Um, so that, now this extraordinary story, the way that we have tagged it, labelled it in our posters, in our marketing is the greatest story ever told, the greatest story ever painted. And virtually all great artists have wanted to tackle this story. A couple of reasons for that. One reason is that it was something that was commissioned and all artists are are dependent on the commissions. And we'll talk about that in relation to this painting in a second. But also it was just such a, a wonderful subject to paint and you can see in this painting I mean you know the drama I mean for an artist to have this you know people know this this is a story that's known we know what's going on but he's got all these characters to paint he's got the dynamism and the energy and the pathos and the sadness all all to paint I mean for an artist it's it's you know it's like being given a seven-figure budget to go and make a thriller. I mean, it's absolutely fabulous. Painting the human body essentially naked so you can really, you know, explore the musculature and so on and so forth. I I spoke to my daughter and her friend, he's staying, and they were saying that with religious art, 
is nearly always dependent on the light. Yeah. Which focuses on each individual, if, especially when figures. It's all, it's all about the light and that will tell the story of who you are meant to be focusing on. Yeah. Does that um, make sense? Well, you're the... Well, it does. I mean, if you look at this, well, if you look at this painting, mm. so actually it's sunset. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the narrative, it is at the end of the day that Jesus is deposed from from the cross. The deposition is when he's... Or is it though? Because didn't all the sky, the sky go dark? Well, it went dark, but it's still <laughs> the end of the day. Okay, fine. But yeah, that could be, that could be the black clouds there. And, and, you know, but basically it's the end of the day, but... Mm. He, Christ himself is the, the central figure here and, and the sheet is bathed in this radiant white light, yeah. which, ha, which has no, it can be no logical reason, isn't, you know, no. they didn't have arc lights in those days. No, um, there should be no light at all, really. No light hardly at all. Any, hardly any. Because the sun's actually setting mm. behind them. They're on the, the hill just outside of the walls of Jerusalem. I went to Jerusalem when I was filming Easter and Up and... Uh, it's really interesting. I was with a guide who's explaining what the geography is thought to have been. And so where you so you can tell the, where the old walls were. Yeah. And you would have taken you would have been led out of the walls of Jerusalem up this small hill where they were where he was crucified. That's now considered to be now within the, the old walls, which was constantly changed. And that's the um um where you now go to see the rock on which he was crucified, oh, okay. but it's now within the old walls, but it was outside the walls in the past, which of course makes absolute sense. Why would you crucify someone inside your own city walls? Yeah, true. Um, and, um, you know, clearly the central, and this is, this is clearly supposed to be God's radiant light. Even in death, he is radiating the light of truth. And this is something that Rubens was absolutely fascinated by. So he's German. He's 10 years old when he goes back to Antwerp, which is where his family had come from. His family actually had fled a fairly nasty war, which was going on between what's known as the Low Countries, um, what we now think of as Belgium and Holland or the Netherlands, um, and it was they were ruled by the Spanish at the time, Spanish mm -hmm. Catholicism too. And they were fighting back and the Spanish had gone in, the Holy Inquisition had gone in and it was all very nasty. So they fled Antwerp, went to Westphalia where um, uh, Siegen, I think it was, where he was born. But anyway, Westphalia, Germany. He then grows up in Antwerp. He studies in Antwerp, but like any artist with you know, aspirations to learn, he decides to go to Italy. He turns up in Italy at a time when the greatest artist of all is Caravaggio. Mm -hmm. And um, he's hugely influenced by Caravaggio. Now you can see, I mean, this doesn't look like a Caravaggio, but certainly with Caravaggio, you almost always, not always, but you almost always have one source of light, yeah. often top right, just bathing the central narrative in 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 light, and here, like you say, you've got this central character who's very bright. Your eye goes straight to it. You've got his body, which you know is devoid of life. It's it's almost almost turning green already, mm. isn't it? It's oh yeah, I mean, it really is. But, but they're just so respectful the way they're taking him down as well. <clears throat> well, you've got this very very white sheet. Mm which in itself is quite shocking because you know it's going to be stained with blood. Mm. And um, then there's characters around, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, is that eight? One, two, yeah. three, yeah. Eight characters kind of circulating. Again, they're all somehow dipping into that light, mm. which again, totally unrealistic really, but you kind of don't really worry too much about it. I mean, the chap at the top, He's got light on the top of his shoulders. Yeah. Well, where is that coming from? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you could say, I suppose it was reflected off the sheet if you wanted to. Reflected off the sheet. But there's, there's no point really, is there? And there's a different, diff, diff, I mean, the, the three Marys at the bottom. Yeah. 
They're they're kind of there is a steelier white, isn't it? Yeah. And the Virgin Mary is definitely the palest of all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> So how do you know she's the Virgin Mary? I looked her up. <laughs> okay. I don't want to get this wrong. <laughs> so but actually to be fair, she does look like a grieving mother. Yeah. Uh compared to the other two. Well Mary Magdalene, of mm-hmm. course, is I mean, she's the one that washes the feet yes. you know, in, in legend. Mm. So I guess that's yeah. her. And the mm. other Mary, Mary, um, Mary Cleophas, mm. never quite sure about her. But I remember being in um, uh, Krakow and, and then in filming in, there, in the museum there, their art gallery, they had a beautiful Three Marys oh. painting. Um so Caravaggio is in Rome and clearly influenced by by the kind of the power and the narrative and the drama of what he sees of Caravaggio. It's not the only influence on him, but I think you can see that in this. Do so nearly all Caravaggios then have black, sort of dark backgrounds? Yes, yeah, so the fre- frequently with Caravaggio, it's mm-hmm. a very dark background, mm-hmm. one source of light mm-hmm. okay. and drama. Right. Um, he, used to, he used to actually paint fairly quickly and even... Even um, when he was fleeing Rome because he murdered a man and oh, getting yeah. into source, and then he, yeah. you know, a late, bit later in his story, he's attacked in Naples, and people think he's been killed. In fact, he's just been very badly injured. He's still painting. Right. It's amazing when you kind of one of the jobs that we do when we're making the film is we put the paint paintings and their the suggested dates of their paintings alongside the biography, and you think. That's going on in his life, and yet he's painting this many paintings. Yeah. Um, Rubens was also prolific. And as you mentioned before we started recording, he had this, um, like like others, like uh, Raphael, you know, a century earlier, had a very strong um, workshop. And um, so often the workshop would... So maybe Raphael would... St- I mean, it's probably not unlike a film in some ways. I don't know. But Raphael, Raphael, Rubens might um, do do the original sketch. Okay. And then the others fill in. He might do a very small painting as a, as a kind of a guide. Uh, and then he would, you know, his, his, his colleagues, his students, his associates would start to fill it out um, up to the point that Rubens himself would complete. Mm-hmm. I think it's fair to say that often, the, you know, the key artist would... Having planned the painting would also be responsible for the faces. Oh, I can um, imagine some bad days in the office. He walks in and and if he's not someone's, happy, yes, yeah, so, someone's done it wrong. Yeah, you can imagine. <laughs> oh yeah, and, and they would have to literally kind of scrape it off. Yeah, yeah and, I can imagine that. But I mean, it's not. I mean, you can imagine with the kind of. I mean, Rubens famously complained once that you know. He had to turn down. He had had to turn down about a thousand people, including friends and his wife, and because he said, "I just can't do everything." Um, oh, what so, for, for commissions? For or commissions to, to, yeah. Okay, wow. So you can imagine yeah. that he would do the bulk of it, and then he would mm. say to his colleagues, "Okay, right, you guys fill in the the clothes and the ladder and the sky." And I don't know. I'm not expert enough on this painting to know what he is thought mm-hmm. to have done and what he's not thought to have done. And he turns um, up for the glory at the end. What well, is fair enough, isn't it? It's his, yeah. It's still a Rubens. I mean, you know, you have today, <laughs> you have artists like Damien Hirst who might not touch some of their paintings, yeah. still sold mm-hmm. for a lot of money as yeah. a Hirst, but mm-hmm. it's been made by his workshop, his factory. Um, so, um, you know, there's a, there's a, there is a bit of a debate there. I think what's quite spectacular about this painting that, which is in Antwerp Cathedral to this day. It actually has alongside it a painting called The Raising of the Cross, which wasn't originally there. It was in a darker location. I did look at that one as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was quite stunning. And they're side by side now. Because they were saying about the diagonals, Yeah, that one. And when he's going, he's raising up. It's that way. It's the other way. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I forgot. I, was being, I forgot we were being recorded. I didn't think we could see us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pointing yeah. with my hands, forgetting. It's all right. The opposite <laughs> diagonal. I get it. <laughs> the interesting thing about this is that you could argue that 
normally, of course, we read, as we've talked about before in the podcast, from left to right. I think there's a good argument to be made here that actually this is unusual and deliberate in that you read right to left. You actually slide down the sheet. And I think that's because when you come to this very deliberately, you've got just to the right of Christ's armpit, basically, uh, or up his arm, you've got actually to the right of his armpit, you've got these the brightest, I mean, it's really very bright white. And your eye can't help but go there first. And then I think you are intrigued then by not Christ, actually. I think you go up because there's a guy up there who's holding the sheet in his teeth. Now, when you look at it a bit harder and you think about it a bit longer, you can see that he's holding the sheet. He's got his other arm obviously precariously standing on something half on the ladder uh, and his other arm is grasping Christ's dead arm. So you can understand the narrative. But when you first look at it, you go to that bright light, you look up, and then you basically slide back down, down the arm, across Christ's face, down his torso. You see the blood. You then go down his arm, down his legs to Mary Magdalene. And then quite deliberately, you, then, you have that circle that happens. So you go through the three Marys up, through the saints and round and background and then I kind of think you kind of do a bit like a snail you do a, a spiral that comes right back into Christ's face again the, for the Romans this was the worst way that they could kill somebody yeah and it was um extremely unpleasant but of course Christ is, you know if you look at the you know look at the Madonna and Childs by Leonardo the reason they're so powerful is that somehow he managed to capture the awareness in the face of Mary, that not only is she looking at her beautiful young baby with love, mm. she's also horrified because she knows what's going to happen. Yeah. And so, you know, Christ's story is predestined. Mm-hmm. Um, so he has to die on the cross because he has to die to then be resurrected. Um, so it's, you know, it's... it's. And that's maybe why they're not showing that she's she hasn't got tears in her eyes, has she? She's not crying. I think maybe she's just sort of resigned herself to, and also this is the destiny. Well, I think there's an element that she knew this was going to happen. I, mm. I doubt that it made it any oh, no. easier for her. But, um, but like you say, watching somebody die in that way. Is... And that's always the thing with, with, I mean, these great paintings like the Salvatore Mundi by Leonardo, which, you know, there's debate about, but. I consider it to be Leonardo. I mean, that the, the capturing of somebody that is divine and human at the same time. So what you have here, very clearly, and, you know, the reason why the church, you know, this is a pretty strong image to have in your cathedral or in your church. You know, it's, it's you could even call it gruesome. But for the Catholic church, it is... It's partly, you know, often these types of images would be behind the mass table. So when the bread and wine is being offered, it is absolutely clear beyond any shadow of the doubt that the body, you know, the body and blood of of Jesus Christ is being shared to you in this kind of tokenistic way. Um, And it's really clear from the painting behind why that is, what it represents. Yeah. Um, it is also uh, uh, um, at a time when, you know, the Christian church is seeking to re-establish itself as a Christian empire. And so you have, um, in Rome in particular, and again, we've talked about this before, but in Rome, you know, the popes there are seeking to, they're also they're seeking to, in a sense, establish themselves as, you know, the new emperors. And that means they're investing in architecture and religious paintings and religious buildings. And, you know, the Vatican is the best example, but it's certainly not the only one. So and, nearly all of his paintings then, religious, Rubens. Oh, OK. No. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say nearly, I wouldn't say that they, not, no. nearly all of them, no. But this was a, he, he loved to do big canvases. Oh, he did, OK. And 
I mean, I suppose in, in some palaces you might get some big canvases, but I mean, where you were likely to get your biggest physical commission was for a church or a cathedral. Yeah, okay. Because you have people sitting a long way away and they need to see the story. You've got big spaces to fill. You know, it'd be ridiculous. I, I mean, I've been to churches and cathedrals where behind the altar you've got, you know, a, a small painting yeah. and it looks kind of silly mm. to our eyes. Mm-hmm. Um also, this is fantastically exciting. Um, and there's all sorts of messages here. I mean, you can see that this man, this poor man, has been brutally murdered, killed. Mm. But for the believers in the church, which would have been basically everyone that came to the cathedral that time, yeah. knew the story that three days later he overcame this. And he was, you know, um, he rose from the dead and... and and so on and so forth. Um, for an artist, though, for, for Rubens, it's an absolute tour de force, okay. and it's considered one of the masterpieces of this kind of Baroque era. Oh, era. Right, okay. Um, and the fact that he'd done the elevation first. The other yeah. One. I wonder if he did one of the resurrection. We should have looked that up. Uh, I don't know offhand no. if he did, no. actually. Um be interesting. I mean, I've always found, to be honest, I've always found Rubens a bit uh, overpowering for me. Um, you know, there's a lot of naked flesh and it's all just a little bit kind of overwrought. Um, wow. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't put him amongst my favourite artists, although, the, you know, there are those that can definitely consider him to be second only to Titian at this period. Um, he was certainly extremely successful, Lived a good thirty years more than Caravaggio. Yeah, so I think he lived in lived to his mid sixties, and he was he was very prolific. Um, well, it's definitely that. <laughs> I mean, I have never. I don't think I've ever looked at one. Maybe I have without noticing, but you can certainly say he's an incredible painter, artist. But yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, it is one of those paintings. I think. Is it, uh, can I say this? I mean, I think I would... I, mean, I think it is, it is a painting that you could recommend people to go and see. Oh, I recommend anyone to go into a cathedral or church. Yeah. That's one of my favourite things to do. That's for sure. Because they are all incredible. And even if you don't believe necessarily in religion or anything, it just it is a, they are lovely places to go. The lovely places, and actually Easter in art, I think, is a very good example whereby whether you are Christian or not, mm. the power and the spirituality mm. of the paintings mm. will connect with you. Yeah. Because this painting, even if you don't believe in Christianity, even if you don't believe that this poor man who, because of his beliefs, um, was crucified, was killed in, a, in a, this ugly way, there's still you know, the pathos of his death. There's still the relationship between a mother and a child. You know, yeah, she's, yeah. she's outlived her child. She's seeing her child, you know, killed. And um, there's 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 yeah. the relationship between the saints and the and Jesus. I mean, there's so much going on. Um, yeah, because Joseph, he, he claims the body, whereas normally they would have just thrown the body, I believe. That's what I read. Sort of to birds and yeah. anyone would have. So he did manage to claim the body to get it to the tomb. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, his request was granted, mm-hmm. wasn't it? Yeah. See, then when you hear about, for example, I mean, you have to be very careful with history because history is often, it's often written by the victors Mm. And they have a real reason to denigrate those who went before them because it shows them in a better light. Um, Roman historians, you know, they're like writers for the sun on the news of the world. I mean, they're right. prone to exaggerate. Mm-hmm. So, for example, Nero is not quite the Nero that we think of. Um, nevertheless, there is a story where he crucified dozens of Christians on the Appian Way leading to Rome. And it was just, just what a disgusting, horrible thing yeah. to do that mm-hmm. these these poor souls were kind of crucified and then 
unless I'm mistaken, set on fire at night to act oh. as torches. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. disgusting. Um, this is a brutal world. Yeah. And, 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 you know, lives were short anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> if you got to your mid thirties, you were doing pretty mm-hmm. well, frankly. Yeah. Um, it's, it's extraordinary. And it's interesting with, with the story of Easter, how, artists you know whether it was commissioned or whether they kind of somehow managed to manipulate themselves to which which part of the story they got to they got to represent so leonardo does the last supper he must have been so excited to do the last yeah. supper because you've got all these disciples and all the drama that's going on different people looking at different ways and um and then something like the supper at emmaus that if you don't know the story of easter you might not know but this is after his resurrection where he's having dinner in, in the evening at this place called Emmaus. And again, they realise that this is the resurrected Christ and all that that means. Um, okay, crazy. I didn't know that. But the descent, but the, the ascent and the descent from the cross are obviously yeah. hugely powerful moments to, to, to be able to paint. Um, doubt, doubting, I mean, Caravaggio does Doubting Thomas. He does... Um, the moment that Peter denies, you know, the denial three times. Three times, denies, in the, isn't that where the cock? And where the cock crows. Yeah, and, I do know, remember bits. <laughs> it's, it's a, and the thing is about the Easter story, mm. which I realised after having made the film, is that it's such a key part of our cultural tapestry. <laughs> yes. We, I mean, whether we believe it or not, we mm. should actually know what the story is. I know, I feel bad I didn't. Well, I don't feel bad. I think everyone's just... Well, I can't say everyone. Well, I say the majority of people. I'll tell you, I went to the coffee shop next to my office when I was making Eastern art. And the the girl behind the counter said to me, um, she knows I make films. She said, what are you working on? I said, I'm doing something called Eastern art. And she said, um, oh, Eastern art, is that anything to do with Christ? Or Jesus, actually, she said Jesus. Okay. <laughs> and you thought to yourself, yeah. well, actually, I've probably thought to myself, Jesus Christ. Mm. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you think, okay, hold on a minute. How yeah. could you? How could you get through your first twenty-three years of your life not realizing that yeah. Easter is associated with? It's almost unfathomable. But then you think, well, if it hasn't been taught at school, mm, no, and if your parents never talked about it, yeah. And if you haven't watched Blue Peter or no, some kind of exactly. de- decent children's education, mm-hmm. um, it's true. It is possible to completely miss this story. Yeah. Um, Don't and, know what path we're all going through. So yeah, hundred percent. You know, I, 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 my I, knowledge is really well. I realise like now thin. You know, my, my I had to explain to my kids what the Falklands War was because the Falklands oh, War. Yeah. What are we now? Twenty twenty one. The Falklands mm-hmm. War. Early 80s, so, you know, it's a good oh, 10, 15 years before they were born. Mm. Um, I I um, hesitated to watch The Crown, I have to say, but then when I did watch it, I must say, I thought it was extremely well done. And I, 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 was, I was actually kind of gripped by it. But every time I looked up one of the historical events, yeah. thinking, really? Yeah. Well... According to Google and Wikipedia and those kind of that basic kind of level of research, all these things did happen. So there's an amazing amount of history in there. But you go through all the prime ministers. Now, I, it comes a point when I remember those prime ministers. So I remember Harold Wilson and Heath and, you know, Blair and Major and Cameron. But for, for my kids, they've got no, no idea. idea. No. Yeah. I don't know them at all. And so <laughs> then you've got things like the Suez and you've got. Um, you know, so lots of events, we just forget that people just don't yeah. know about. And I think Easter does fall into that. Um, and I think that's what puts people off. So you go to the National Gallery, you go one way and you end up in front of Van Gogh's Sunflowers. Mm-hmm. And that's such an easy painting. It is a bright, beautiful painting of flowers in a vase, you, there's not a person on the planet that doesn't understand what no. that is. You go and stand in front of this painting. Yes. <laughs> or you go to these galleries where it's other saints, where you might have some a saint with arrows coming out of him mm. or a saint that's been crucified upside down. Or It's like, I don't know what all this is. It's all too no. complicated. 
And even this might feel kind of gruesome and a bit... So again, it's one of those things we just have to think, you know what, I'm just going to look at this painting, try and understand it. It's like um, we said last week, and just pick... Pick one. Just pick, well, definitely just pick one. Mm. In Maybe in religious paintings. I mean, I did look at two. I mm. looked at the other one. I looked at the elevation of on the cross for the cross mm. on the cross to the cross, just because I was interested in that diagonal line. Mm. Uh, and yeah, apart from the vinegar story, has brought a few things back into my head. <laughs> and I'm going to tell Matt when I get home. <laughs> well, I mean, it definitely wasn't someone. <laughs> someone was actually trying to be kind, and not be horrible. Yeah. But we did spend a whole afternoon discussing well, bear in mind, what a horrible death that would be, to be fair. Bear in mind that it was really, everyone knew it was really dangerous to drink water. Oh, yeah, of course. So, um, yeah, see, I hadn't thought that. It's really interesting, isn't it? This is why on board ships it, yeah. they, would, they would drink, like, why did they'd be drinking water? beer yeah. or, um, um, you know, rum or whatever it was because it was it was relatively safe. I was in Thailand once in the hill tribes and they put iodine tablets into the water. Mm. Tastes all right, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> was, was like, well. Did you say so? It was all right. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, okay, so um, that's why the vinegar. Okay. Maybe. It makes sense. Um, it's, it's definitely better than Matt's version. So, you know. I think also when I look at paintings like this, I also think to myself, this starts as a blank canvas. Yeah. And then, you know, this artist is so good mm. that you are totally take not taken in by, but I mean the the three dimension three dimensionality of it is totally convincing. Mm. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's, it's a, incredible. Yeah, if you look at the feet on mm. the stairs, on the steps. Mm. I mean, he's got the perspective absolutely spot on, and the way his opinion. back is arched out as yeah. he's collecting the body. The guy, yeah, guy hang, yeah. I mean, the other guy holding on with his left hand, mm. the sheet. In fact, the sheet's already getting smudges of blood on it. But all of them holding on to the sheet is really... Yeah. And you can cut... Maybe that, maybe... Um, you just, I don't know, you can feel the weight of that body, which is now devoid of life, mm. kind of falling into the sheet, which they're going to wrap it in and before taking it off to the tomb. And the, and the tenderness of their... They also... Yeah. They're just so desperately want to look after him. Yeah, yeah. And the body. And he's, he's, he's died. How we all do when someone dies, you know, you somehow want to look after them, mm. which is actually quite strange in a funny way. It's yeah. maybe the last thing you can do. I better be careful because I might start crying now. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, I do that. <laughs> but, I mean, some, some um, yeah, and some, you know, like in... in Hinduism and Buddhism, mm. once the person has died, they consider the body to be an empty vessel and yeah. to be disposed of as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. We tend to, and Catholicism not least, tends to revere the dead body and then you have holy relics and, you know, there's so many bones of Christ that... <laughs> oh, right. Um, but uh, hmm. there is an element of that here, the, the reverence for this... You know, as you say, they're treating it with great care, mm. even though he's clearly died. Yeah, just yeah, it really does feel that way. Mm, quite, quite mm. a painting. 16, it is. 1611, so... It is. 510 years yeah. ago. And, and still... I still have, always can't go over the colours. I wonder what they're like. I mean, I haven't been there, obviously, but I can imagine they're still amazing. So, yeah, that, yeah that's something itself, isn't it? Yes. Okay, and what? So that's and Peter what? Paul yeah. Rubens, Descent from the Cross, 1611, 1614, there or thereabouts, and in Antwerp Cathedral. Oh. Worth a visit. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening to the Painting of the Week podcast. For more information, please visit our website at seventh-art.com or contact us by emailing info at seventh-art.com. See you next time.